Just a quick note, in addition to uploading the show in its entirety and in an audio podcast version, we are now doing both in segments, so you can watch and listen at your leisure. Next on Rugby Wrap-Up, Steve Lewis, Brian Ray, and Matt McCarthy with important stuff on each team in Major League Rugby 2021. Rugby Wrap-Up brought to you in part by The Pig & Whistle, the world's best rugby pub. The Murphy Kennedy Group, founded with the idea that construction can be done better. And Lean and Limber, stretching your way to a healthier lifestyle. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rugby Wrap-Up. It is good to see you again, and it is good to see my good friends, Mr. Stephen Lewis and Mr. Brian Ray. I'm Matt McCarthy in the Upper West Side. Or, Stephen, is it on the Upper West Side of Manhattan? Yeah, it's Bougieville to uh, local residents. Brian, how is it up there? Are, you, are, you, are your feet frozen to the ground? Yeah, they're pretty much stuck where I'm sitting right now. I haven't moved actually in about a month, so a little bit frustrating, but uh, we'll get there. A quick question. I mean, I, you know I'm a big proponent of masks, but are you going to wear that thing the whole show? You know, as, again, as I said to Zach Lanning in his new uh, recurring segment, Zach Attack, I didn't even realize I was wearing it. I wear this thing all the time. It's the pig and whistle, man. It's the coolest rugby pub in the world. This thing is so cool. I don't even know I have it on. And it's not a shameless plug for the bar that's opening again, thankfully, on March 11th. You're welcome, Cormac McCormack. Okay, let's get to our show. Before we get into the Major League Rugby stuff, where you two give uh, a rundown of the Western Conference and Eastern Conference, respectively, there's some bullet points or some news items that we should go over across the globe, the rugby the rugby world. Uh, the first of which is not the greatest news on the planet, the fact that the Women's Rugby World Cup has been postponed, Brian. Yeah, disappointing, certainly for a lot of players and, uh, you know, unions and so on getting ready for it. But uh, and certainly myself, I was very much looking forward to the tournament, but uh, probably the right decision. Uh, you know, there's still teams to qualify and, and, you know, a lot of players are still amateur, so you can't really make plans to go when everything's up in the air. So, uh, and, you know, from an, a selfish perspective from Canada and USA's perspective, uh, gives, you know, both younger teams. So it'll give them a little bit more time to get ready. So, you know, all in all, probably the right decision, just kind of hard to take right now, but we'll get over it. Steven, we've got sevens back on the circuit. I mean, we, aside from the, the Madrid sevens, which Zach Lanning talked about in our other segment, but HSBC World Series 7 is back on. Yeah, a recent announcement from World Rugby that the World Series uh, would return uh, in an abridged format. So right now it's just four for the men, five for the women. So Hong Kong, uh, Cape Town, Dubai, Singapore. Singapore, Singapore. Singapore. Yeah, so so that, that's good. That's great news for both men and women's sevens and the game of sevens. So hopefully the Olympics goes ahead and we maintain some of that momentum. And just to tie it back to the last point, I I thought it was strange timing, however, for World Rugby to announce the postponement of the Women's World Cup 15s and then a day later, the resumption of the World Series 7s. Um, Two things on that. One, it helps players to a certain extent. Certain players who are trying to do both obviously now have to focus on Olympics and 7s, but then they can return their gaze to the World Cup next year. So maybe that works out for them. But I think it's, it's it's an odd one here. Why is one event deemed unsustainable and another event which actually involves much more travel and probably as many people deemed you know feasible and i think we know what the answer is so Stephen, it's very cool that the women have five stops the men have four is there any shot that's going to even up with la being added to the roster yeah, the, so the LA Sevens has been confirmed. It's not a part of the World Seven Series. Uh, it's a standalone tournament, sorted by AEG and our good friend Dan Lyle. Uh, it's going to be the weekend, June 25th, 26th. Um, the field is not completely uh, set in terms of who's being invited. Don't have the details as yet, but just terrific to have a premier Sevens event back on North American soil. And, of course, a fantastic opportunity for both the American and Canadian men's and women's teams to get a a good hit out one month before the Olympics. Good Brian, news. that's a big rugby weekend. You've got – it's a major league rugby weekend. And don't, don't we have um, another international is – is USA playing that weekend? 
Well, it sounds like we're talking about a potential of a South Africa game against the Eagles, uh, kind of as a precursor to the Lions tour. So certainly that would be uh, an interesting one. You know, timing obviously isn't ideal for MLR, but certainly that's a huge deal for uh, the States. You should add as well, uh, Vancouver could have a tournament coming up in September. There's some talk about that as well. So could have the Vancouver Sevens again this year as well. Some hope. Fingers crossed. And then finally, there's a lot of whinging about out of the six nations about the refereeing mostly from english fans about welsh the welsh team winning again brian well uh yeah a couple bad calls referee knows he screwed up wales knew they screwed up but who cares look at the score line and look how england played how many penalties did they give away particularly in the in that second half they uh, i don't think they played well at all uh wales were deserved winners so i don't know to me there a lot of noise about not much yeah, and God forbid the sun shines on the Welsh for a day in rugby. And England's got bigger issues than the refereeing when they lose to Scotland and Wales. They lost to Scotland, Stephen, as you may or may not know, at Twickenham. And finally, Stephen, let's stay on you because you're pretty much the closest thing we have to a Frenchman. I'm sorry, Brian, you're not, you're not, you're not cutting it. France, little scandal. Yeah, well, as an unabashed Francophile, I like my Gallic cousins, but this has certainly been a very French week in international rugby. The aforementioned Pascal Gozer, the referee, making an absolute uh, dog's breakfast of it, shall we say, in um, Petit Déjeuner de Chien, I believe in French, um, of that game. And then, of course, we've had this COVID scandal. So essentially 11 players, 10 players, and the head coach, Fabien Gauthier, tested positive for uh, COVID prior to the Scotland game, which forced the postponement of that game, which was the right decision. It has since transpired that Fabien went to watch his son play and 10 of the other Frenchmen went out for waffles in Rome. Why you would go for waffles in Rome, I don't know, given the other culinary choices. Have but, you had the, wa- the waffles in Rome are to die for? I, I'm okay. just telling you, man. It's- I'll tell you word for it. But anyway, and then and a further, you know, spectacularly French um, denouement to the whole situation. They, uh, they come out and they clear all of them and there's no problem. It's not an issue. Scotland, on the other hand, now have to play a game six days after the last game and potentially not have players released by English clubs. So I love France, but this really ought to be a 28-0 forfeit at this point. Inadvertent, and you know, we may see this in MR down the road. If, if There are going to be positive cases. And if they happen inadvertently with the best wishes, everyone following the protocols, that's Okay. When you have 11 members who, of a team who know what they're supposed to be doing, who don't do it, that's different to me. We're going to take a quick break and come back with our Major League Rugby Rundown, our first one of the year. Very excited to do this. Uh, but before we do, Stephen, I just want to say I think it's denouement. I'm just going to say that. Maybe that's the American bastardization or the Canadian French. What do you call a person who speaks three languages? Trilingual. What do you call a person who speaks two languages? Bilingual. Mm -hmm. What do you call a person who speaks one language? American. Yaksimash Mamkata Dobje. We'll be right back with Steve Lewis and Mr. Brian Ray after this. If you're in New York City and want to watch some great rugby, have some great food, and some great times, go to the world's best rugby pub, The Pig and Whistle, on West 36th Street. been blind since I was four and I've never seen a beer commercial or a beer label none of that stuff influences me I drink beer because of the taste and my beer is Pabst Blue Ribbon it has a taste on the flavor what do you think's on the label I think there's a a naked woman riding on a unicorn jumping over fire That's good beer. And we are back. Steve Lewis, Brian Ray, Matt McCarthy. Gentlemen, now we have that opportunity that's escaped us for such a long time. The ability to run down a major league rugby week or season because it hasn't started yet, but we're getting closer by the second and it's time to do a major league rugby rundown.
each of you will break down each team in a conference. Steven, you're going to do the Western Conference because as the general manager or whatever the current title is for Rugby United New York, it would be a conflict of interest for you to critique your own division. And Brian, you don't have any stake in the game other than being a fair and balanced pundit. So we figured you could be somebody that is somewhat objective about the East. So Stephen, we'll start with you and we're going to go up West to the team that doesn't get as much recognition as they should because they are the two time and still reigning champions of major league rugby, the Seattle Seawolves. And they are the reigning champions, ladies and gentlemen, as per COVID like Steve Lewis is still the reigning USA rugby coach of the year. So two time. So, Stephen, why don't we start with you? What do you see? What, what, what is, what's the thing about Seattle for you? Yeah, well, maybe just generally before Seattle. I mean, as you say, we're now two weeks out just over from March 20, the start of the Major League Rugby season. So it's, it's beyond exciting for players, for fans, coaches. Um, everyone is just wants to get back out there, uh, even under these pretty challenging conditions in ter- terms of COVID protocols. I think it's going to be tricky to handicap this year. I think there's a lot of players who haven't played rugby for 12 months. They're only starting to get some scrimmages last week. Um, that, that's changed a lot of us in a lot of different ways. Some players will not be what they were before, physically or mentally. Um, some other players may be better. So it, it's really a difficult one to talk. I think generally speaking, there's an uptick in the quality of rosters. Um, so I think that's across the board. And so we're looking forward to that. But um, with Seattle, defending champions, as you say, Keith Lensing, the coach, Matt Turner still heavily involved. Um, they haven't made big splashes, certainly in terms of their roster. And they've been pretty, you know, like the rest of us, inactive in terms of, uh, you know, warm-up games. So, so difficult to, to discuss them in any great changes at this stage. Yeah, you know, they have a good core. They retain their core. It was kind of like... And Colby Marshall talks about the the, uh, the re- return of Ross Neal in the back line. He picked him in his in his the Marshall plan, a new segment. Um, but you know they are they are the reigning champions. They they have gelled somewhat. So good to good to see them back and see. Interesting to see what happens because the other teams out there made some big big acquisitions. Uh, but Brian, let's go back across the country and go south to the Atlanta team, the Atlanta Arrows. <laughs> the Atlanta Arrows. I love it. Yeah, uh, you know, kudos to uh, Rugby ATL for opening their doors and, and helping us uh, freezing Canadians to come enjoy the warmth for a, a few months. Hopefully we get this situation under control and they can go back up the north where they belong. Uh, I'm really excited for this campaign for the Arrows. Obviously, they're in great shape uh, heading into last year, top uh, seed in the east. Uh, a lot of continuity in that team, which is, I think, a big strength for them. Um, and uh, really, I, I like the Seth America they brought in, uh, you know, Manuel Montero, Joaquin Tukule are huge players for them. Really going to add, you know, even though they've lost guys like Sam Malcolm and, and Dan Moore, uh, this is a good tight group, a couple young guys to watch out for. I won't name them now, but maybe later. Um, so I, I'm excited. I think it's going to be a strong year for uh, Toronto. I think that's going to be reflected in the standings. All right, Stephen, continuing the thread of uh, cities, uh, teams in different cities. How about the Las Vegas Legion of San Diego, California? Right. Well, they, um, they, they performed. They're one of the strongest teams historically and were going well last year and have a great squad. Um, so coached by Scott Murray and Zach Test, that's the same coaching tandem. Uh, obviously, they made some big name acquisitions, probably the biggest of which Chris Robshaw, the former England captain, who instead of, um, you know, a season surfing in San Diego, he's now sort of rolling the dice and moving to Vegas. Another, another interesting addition for me is Cecil Africa, who, of course, is a Blitzbocker seven superstar from South Africa. So I'm excited to see where he ends up. And actually, I'm quite interested as a sevens proponent uh, to see just how he, uh, you know, how he translates into the 15s game, where they put him. Will he get the space? You know, will he be on the wing and get a barrage of high balls for the first uh, 10 minutes of the, every game? Yeah, so Africa did say on this program during the World Tens that he was likely to be playing fullback. That's that's his position in 15s. But, you know, they've got some depth and they've got some great great players on that roster. Brian, let's get back east 
and will stay in Atlanta, the Atlers. ATL is a little bit slow, we'll say, in the communication side. So it wasn't really all that up to speed in the, on their roster until they got into that game. But now we have a pretty good idea. Uh, they've got some of those key South Africans coming back. Johan Momsen in the second row. Ryan Nell just getting over a knee injury. But uh, add in Batista Escura, the, uh, the Pumas guy, really creative attack back. Uh, uh, Robbie Petzer, of course, he was supposed to go to Dallas. Now he's signed for them. So a uh, really interesting back line they've got. Um, They've got a ridiculous amount of loose forwards, <laughs> a lot of quality guys. Uh, Ross Deacon is certainly well-known in New York. Uh, you know, I, I just kind of worry a little bit about their tight five strength. Uh, we'll see how, how they uh, adjust during the season. But an, an exciting team. Uh, I think they're building towards uh, something big in the future. I don't think this is going to be uh, quite their year as far as uh, making the postseason. But uh, an interesting team, one to watch. Let's go to the Giltinis. Los Angeles, you mean? Um, yeah, obviously, uh, coming into league this year, a lot of excitement, a lot of hype, very strong Australian flavor. Uh, they made a statement both by saying they're going to play in the Coliseum, which is uh, interesting. And certainly if you want to do social distancing, that's the spot to do it. Um, in terms of their playing roster, again, as I said, heavily Australian. You're looking at Ashley Cooper signed, uh, rumor has it, Gitto's there. Uh, Billy Meeks. I mean, just lots of quality players. Uh, a couple also from Scotland, incidentally, that they picked up from Glasgow, Glenn Bryce and Adam Ash. They're out there. And for the bit of um, Fenian flavor, the McNulty brothers are both playing in LA this year as well. Brian, from Atlanta, we go north to Old Glory. Their struggles last year were, were heavily in the tight five. Well, of course, they surprised us all with their ridiculous record, uh, winning games even though they had no scrum. But they've kind of bolstered that. They pick up Stephen Longwell, a big Scotsman, uh, to anchor that, that scrum. A um, couple other interesting prospects. Jack, Jack Ascaro, uh, looking forward to seeing him. He's he's kind of earmarked to take over from where the Beast was, a really good American prospect. So, uh, you know, another team, uh, I, I would say a similar thing with them. Uh, their first 15 looks competitive. Beyond that, I think they're a little bit short in experience and depth, but uh, they'll be an exciting team to watch. Stephen, let's go back down into Texas and go to the Sabercats. Yes, our friends in Houston. So they, they haven't made big splashes in terms of uh, roster changes, what have you. Still the same coaching combination, Paul Healy and Paul Emmerich. Beautiful stadium. I, I, I'm really interested about, without getting too political, but, you know, the Texas restriction thing being completely free. Um, I just wonder how that's going to impact the league, certainly early on. Uh, I'm a little concerned, to be honest. Brian, let's go north again to New York. Rugby United New York, new ownership, a new logo. We don't know the venue yet, I don't think. We'll ask Steve about that in a second. But what do you think uh, while Steve's looking at you staring holes in the back of your head? <laughs> uh, I really like the squad they put together by some random individual. Uh, I mean, you look at the second second row strength, uh, Nate Brakely, uh, Charlie Hewitt, of course, coming last year. And now they've got Nick Savetta, which is just ridiculous to me. Um, you know, I hear there's a couple of the front rowers to be announced this week, too. So they look pretty stocked in, in the tight five. Certainly uh, the backs, we've got a couple Kiwis. Andy Ellis, I mean, the, the old All Blacks. I'm really interested to see how he goes, actually. Uh, you know, what is he? 36 years old, but he's reportedly in very good shape. So um, my only concern there would be that behind him, we've got two very young guys, Connor McManus and Connor Buckley, who are inexperienced. So it seems to be a lot hinging on, on, on Mr. Ellis staying fit and leading that side. So, and, and there's another guy, Quinn Nowati, uh, this Canadian fella, six foot four center, who's got huge potential, even if he's not starting day in and day out. Uh, you know, I think he's one to watch and Troy Lockyer is another guy I love. So uh, this is a really good squad. Hey, Hey, what do we get this week? Luke Hume is back. Huh? You yeah, know, you got to be excited about that. So uh, a nice mix, I think. Uh, certainly, they'll be in the in that playoff hunt along with uh, Toronto and Nola. I think we got to take a quick break. We don't go away. We'll be right back. And we're back again. Stephen, we left off just before you were about to talk about maybe arguably your second favorite drink in Major League Rugby, a Gilgroni, the Austin Gilgronis. I think they have made some good moves. I think they're, they've made probably the most significant upgrades, both organizationally um, in terms of the coaching and backroom staff. 
Sam Harris is coaching. They've also brought in Bryce Campbell. Uh, they've got a couple of All Blacks, Frank Halai and Jamie McIntosh, Whopper. Uh, I, I just look at that score and I just see things ticking up there. I, I'm quite impressed by what's going on down there. So I, I think they're going to be more of a force this year. We're going to continue north. And then before we get back to, to, to New Orleans, let's go to the Free Jacks. Yeah, this is a team that made a lot of changes in the offseason. Uh, a lot of new guys coming in. A new coach, Ryan Martin, comes in from Otago. Uh, he's got, brought a couple of his players with him. Uh, Lecky Morris, Lome. This, uh, yeah, so a lot of turnover, I think, in this team. You know, uh, you know, they got John Pohl in the scrum halfback. They got Bowden Waka, the fullback. Of course, we saw what he could do last year. So, you know, a couple guys coming back who are repeats, but I just think there's so many changes um, on paper. It looks good, but to, to bring them all together, they're not going to have any warm up games. Now uh, I think it'll be a, maybe a slow start to the season. They'll get going, but I think this is a team that's more uh, peaking towards 2022 as opposed to 2021, just with all the changes they've got. Yeah. And they've got, they've got a nice situation going on up there. They've got a sound um, ownership group, sound organization. I think they're playing a little bit of the, the longer game there, yeah. which is probably a wise thing. Steven, the Utah Warriors. Yeah, Utah. So, again, a, co- a coaching change there. Chris Latham has moved on, and he's been replaced by Sean Pittman, um, who's a relatively young uh, head coach, assistant forwards coach with the Eagles the last couple of years. What's interesting about Utah is you touched on it earlier with, you know, differing political jurisdictions and different attitudes towards things. Utah's been pretty much open for about five, six months. So they've played a lot of games, not, not, the, not the first team squad, but they've been able to do a lot of development stuff. They've been able to look at a lot of players. Brandon Sparks, their director of rugby, knows his stuff, and they've been very active. So, you know, who knows what they've got up their sleeves because they, they've, they've had the ability to be more active than, the, than some other teams. And with a relatively short, like truncated five-week preseason for the rest of us, perhaps that will help them. And that, that also goes for Atlanta. It also goes for New Orleans. All right. Speaking of New Orleans, Brian, they are in the Eastern Conference. Some people are confused about that, including yours truly. But that's not surprising. What do you see for uh, Nolan Nate Osborne's crew? Yeah, well, as Steve said, that you know they've been working through some development games uh, in the fall. They played against uh, Utah, uh, I think, in ATL as well. Um, so, and, and a lot of continuity in that side. You know, they they, they tend to set, sign their players on longer term contracts, but they've also bolstered their team with a few notable additions: uh, Devin Short and JP Duplessis coming in uh, from San Diego. Those are big additions. Juan Capillo, the Argentine uh, center, uh, another one. So, uh, you know, this is a good team, and they've been building it. And it's kind of one of those things where you know they, we've seen them kind of push towards the playoffs, but not being able to make that next step. So this is kind of their test this year. Are they going to uh, really challenge for that top spot uh, this year? Um, well, I guess we're going to find out, but certainly uh, Nate Osborne, one of the uh, more creative coaches out there, I think uh, he can get the most out of that squad. We are out of time, gentlemen. Any final thoughts on what we've discussed so far, Brian? I'm just hugely excited to see the season. I'm, I'm even excited for the playoff or the preseason games that are coming up. I mean, you know, I was crushed when you know, the Free Jack scheduled the game against Old Glory, but uh, we're almost there. We're coming up to a uh, preseason in just a matter of days. And then, yeah, <laughs> March 20th. Can't wait. Steve, you still pitching yourself or you've been, you've been, you've been at it in, in, in the operations end of it on a daily basis, seven days a week, seven days a week. But it's got to still be exciting. Yeah, more so now than, say, two months ago. Absolutely. You see the players, they're out, you're throwing a ball around. We had a, a scrimmage last Saturday, so it's, it's great to see a team come together. Um, I just have a little word of caution. I mean, I just, um, it's important we play this season. I think we're in great shape. I think everyone's worked really, really hard to get here. I think it's important, though, to remember other leagues with massive budgets, NFL, NBA, uh, and what have you, NHL, have run into a couple of problems over the course of a season. So to expect MLR to get through a whole 16-game program squeaky clean and, and not, you know, unfortunately pick up a COVID positive here or there would be unrealistic. So I think people come into it as long as we, as long as we, everyone knows we're following the rules, following the protocols, keeping the players safe. And if we, if we get a game postponed, we get a game postponed. Uh, it's about getting back on the field. Uh, but we are out of time. But before we go, just a couple of quick things. I wanted to on. I know that we all want to wish Perry Baker a speedy recovery. We're all rooting for him. He's a great guy, great player. 
I really like all of you, including you two, to get on the rugby wrap up Red Cross blood donor team. Thanks to Paul Schenkel, a buddy of mine from the University of Buffalo Alumni Rugby. Uh, he started this. We, we're working with him. So please go on the app. It's very easy. Download it to your phone. And it's a team thing. So we're all accumulating points every time somebody donates a pint. And you can save up to three lives with one pint. And check out our other new segments with Zach Lanning in the Zach Attack and the Marshall Plan with Colby Marshall. On behalf of Mr. Stephen Lewis, Mr. Brian Ray, I'm Matt McCarthy for Rugby Wrap-Up. We'll see you next time.